Yeah, I get the thing. Okay. Cool. Okay, well, um, thanks for coming out. We are doing a demonstration on canning, in particular pressure canning. And we'll go over the differences between when you would want to do what's called water bath canning versus pressure canning. We'll go over um, the basic parts of a pressure canner. And then we'll also do a demonstration of canning tomatoes. So that way you can actually see how to go through the whole process start to finish. Um, so the first thing that we'll do is um, turn on the burners. You want both of them on? Yeah. And then while the water is boiling, we'll go through the parts of a pressure canner. So, um, first of all, there are two main types of canning. One is water bath canning, in which you rely on boiling water um, to process your preserved food. And then the second is what we're going to go through is pressure canning. And that requires like steam that's under pressure. Um, and the distinction between the two types of foods that you preserve are normally water bath canning is used for highly acidic foods. like pickles and jams and things of that nature, whereas um, pressure canning is used for low acid foods like meats and vegetables and soups and things like that. And the reason why is um, a low acid environment is still amenable for the bacteria that causes botulism. And so you need to have the higher pressure to reach the higher temperatures in order to kill off that bacteria. So, um, so this is our pressure canner, and um, we use a Presto 23 quart canner. And um, the main parts are, are the this is the canner, um, this is the lid. There's a vent right here, a vent port right here, and uh, a pressure dial, and a vent lock right here that um, raises up when pressure. Yeah, this is better, I think. Okay. And let's see. And the vent lock, actually, I don't know if you can see it from here, but there's a little tab um, on the canner right here. And the vent lock pops up against that tab and it's a safety feature so that way when the pressure canner is under pressure you can't take the lid off. Um, let's see, so um, I'm trying to think of what else we were going to cover. One, one safety consideration too every time you use your pressure canner you want to make sure that this paint that's on the top is clear because it'll get all kinds of like residue and stuff like that, and if you're not that deprived, you're going to build up too much pressure and blow your canner lid. Yeah. Um, some other features about this canner, the Presto canner, is that you it comes with this pressure dial, um, which you use you can use to measure the pressure um, when you start canning. But actually, we and it also comes with. It also comes with a 15 pound uh, regulator that you'll put on here. Um, but the problem is most canning recipes only require 10 pounds of pressure. So what we bought was a three piece cap that comes separately. There are one, two, and three pieces. And this is, and the two pieces by themselves, 10 pounds. And so we bought this separately, so that way you could rely on this um, jingling, which we'll go over later on, rather than the pressure dial. Because the, the other problem too with the pressure dial is that you have to, um, you have to babysit it while it's processing. And so sometimes it'll take like an hour, an hour and a half to process for certain recipes. And so this allows you to know that it's reaching pressure and have the peace of mind, but you don't have to stand by the canner all the time. And then the second thing is normally it's recommended that you have the pressure dial calibrated like once a year um, to make sure that it's reading correctly. 
Um, and in this case, you can just rely on this and not have to worry about whether this is reading over or under pressure. Okay, so this is starting to boil slowly. So what I'll do is go over how um, you can start to can tomatoes. And we're just gonna do um, one jar of tomatoes, but actually this canner has the capacity to hold 16 of these or oh, awesome. oops, seven of those. Um, we'll clean it back. Yeah, we'll clean it back. And the nice, other nice part about this pressure canner, which is the 23 quart one, is we bought um, a canning rack to go along with it. It already comes with one that's on the bottom of the canner now. Um, you can buy a second canning rack to stack jars. And so um, it'll fit like eight of these, um, two layers of eight, uh, either small jar, half pint jars, or pint jars. And the reason why you need two of those racks is because you need one on the bottom to make sure that the glass doesn't come in direct contact with the canner, otherwise it can crack the glass. So then you need a second one to put in the second layer. Okay, so let's see. So let's start with tomatoes. And basically, this recipe for canning tomatoes is really simple. Um, all you need to do is basically blanch and peel the tomatoes like you would, um, you know, for like a normal tomato, you know, sauce recipe. And what you do is you'll just core your tomato and make a cross, like just slice across. Um, an X, so to speak, there. And then we'll boil it in water in here. And then I've already done a couple beforehand, and so we'll let those boil in here. And then you just, oh, I'll do that with her. And then you um, blanch it, so you boil it here for a couple minutes, and then put it in a, a pot of cold water. And then after that, it'll just peel the uh, peel the peel off. Is that what so, it means to blanch it? Yeah, let's blanch it. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for things to boil? Is there some new? Oh. Um, is, is there something you look for, or you know, look for in terms of like? Uh, bad trait when, when looking at tomatoes? Are there some that like, oh yeah, you definitely want to can that tomato? Did you catch the question? Right. So the question is, um, is there any trait you can look for in tomatoes to know that like it's a bad tomato that you don't want to can? Um, not necessarily. I mean, just I guess the general traits for tomatoes for, you know, just to make sure that, you know, it's not too mushy and, you know, it's not, yeah. Spoiled or anything like that. Yeah, especially with the pressure canning, you're putting so much heat and pressure on the vegetables that they tend to get very soft. Um, so anything that's even on, even slightly on the side of soft, I would not pressure can because it's just going to turn into a mush. Basically, so you want a little bit on the firmer side. Um, I guess we can also go through some of the different types of uh, brands of canners as well. Um, so this is a Presto and they run maybe about $80 or so, less than 100 And then, this, so this is the brand that we use. And there's also Miro, which I think is on the back of your handout, M-I-R-O. And then there's a third brand that's kind of the heavy duty brand that's all American. And those run about $250 or so. And so when we were first getting started, which is about two years ago, we relied on Presto just because we weren't really sure if we were gonna adopt this like long term. Um, but it's a pretty good investment, it's a pretty handy canner. Um, and um, but the All American I've heard are pretty good in terms of those are the canners that will like last for decades. You know, you have like grandma who bought like her all American canner and still so good 30, 40 years later type of thing. <laughs> Like 
So the question was essentially, is there a life span on this type of canner before you expect it to kind of like? Um, yeah, I'm actually not familiar with what how long they last. I would I would guess at least you know five to ten years at the very least, but actually I'm not 100 percent sure how long any of these ones last. And, and that's one thing you want to be careful of, um, especially if you start using it heavily, is always to do like a safety inspection beforehand and make sure like everything's sealed. You don't see any cracks. Um, we, we haven't had any problems yet. We've been using this for, what, three or four years now? Uh, yeah, two or three years, okay. yeah. Um. I guess another point, too, is that getting a pressure canner is nice because the, the water bath version of canning, you can do all that in this canner, too. Mm -hmm. like, you yeah. don't need a, a separate pot, whereas you can't use like a normal you know, boiling water pot to do pressure canning. I have another question. Um, so are there spots to look for where cracks are most likely to occur? So the question was, are there spots where cracks are more likely to form that they should look for? And here? Yeah, if, if there's going to be any kind of defect. Um, I think the, the one of the things to, to keep a lookout for is, um, is, really is your gasket and just making sure that there aren't any cracks or anything for your gasket because that's what helps hold the seal. So the black gasket around the edge there? Yeah. I would, I would also check I would also check just basically anywhere hardware is attached because that's where you're going to have any kind of connection point is going to be the weakest so where you have like your your uh, what do you call it the spout the vent the vent yeah and things like that I would check around there um, the canner itself is probably unlikely to crack before the lid does so this is where your, most of the damage would take place okay so it looks like our tomatoes. Are starting to peel. Um, uh, they're still like still kind of touched there. But I guess another thing we can go over is just the general parts of the of uh, your kind of equipment. So normally you'll have your jar if you're not familiar already, and then you'll have your screw-on caps, and you'll have. Um, a lid and then that will be your kind of assembly and then um, ball which is a pretty common company that produces uh, equipment for canning they have a kit where you have a funnel and you actually don't need this but it's helpful to have anyway and so we had on hand for other canning that we do um, you have this magnet which when you're doing a lot of canning you would have normally have a bunch of these and some boiling or some more water, and so this is really good, helpful to grab these. Um, and then we have this, which is used to help um, remove air bubbles, as well as this is used to help measure headspace, which is important in order to main maintain a vacuum when you're um, when the um, when the product cools. And so we'll go over that to ensure you have to measure headspace. And then this is probably one of the most important pieces is a jar lifter, which ours is a little worn, a little rough around the edges, we'll get a new one soon. Okay, so that gave me enough time, I think, to... Yeah. So just lift these out of the water and put it in a bath of ice water. And then I will put this last one in here. Oh, yeah. Also, another thing that I forgot to mention earlier is normally you'll want to um, sterilize your jars. So we did this beforehand because it would take a little long for the demo. But basically, to st um, sterilize your jars beforehand, you boil them in water for about 10 minutes at a hard boil. Um, and so this was already sterilized in our little um, pot of water. And at this point, I think we're ready to peel the tomatoes and we can start filling them, the jar. Okay, and while she's doing that, I just wanted to point out that the, the jar that she sterilized, if you look at it, it's a little cloudy, it's a little murky, and that's because we use the water here that's hard, it's got minerals and stuff in it. If you see that at home, one way to help prevent that is to add just a little bit of vinegar to the water that you're using to sterilize with, and it'll keep the minerals from collecting on the, on the jars themselves. So, 
Uh, what I'm doing is just quartering the tomatoes and we'll just can them in their own juices. Um, some, can, some, some recipes will call for um, adding water, um, some, but this one you can just can it in its own juice. Any questions while she's doing that? No? Okay. So she asked if we were doing seeds and everything, and yeah, we are. We, we put everything in there. Um, but you can choose not to put the seeds in there. It just takes a little longer. <laughs> And then the recipe also calls for about a tablespoon of lemon juice. And so I'll just kind of eyeball it for the purpose of the demo. What's the purpose of the lemon juice? Yeah. Um, so I, what I believe the purpose is, even though your water bath can, or even though you're pressure canning, I think you still need to maintain a certain amount of acidity. Um, in the recipe, and I think part of the problem is like a lot of tomatoes, they, the acidity has been decreasing over time um, compared to like some more vintage tomatoes. Um, I'm not really sure what the pH is supposed to be off the top of my head, but I think that's what the purpose is. So this recipe calls for an inch of head space, which is up to this little mark here. And as you can see, we're a little bit short, so that's why we have the other tomato boiling right now. So each one of those notches is a quarter inch, um, and you'll usually have a, either between a quarter inch to an inch of head space, depending on the recipe. And then also, um, I'm using this tool to try to get rid of any air bubbles and stuff like that as well. Um, because that helps you ensure that you have the proper amount of headspace. What happens if you just do it like that and you don't fill it up to the mark you need? So the question is what would happen if you basically can that with too much headspace? Um, I can't remember. So, so I think in general, and I could be wrong, but I think in general, yeah, it's, it's to make sure that when you, depending on the temperature and the time that you process for, that you create enough pressure that it'll vacuum the seal of the lid on there. So it, essentially, if you have too much or too little air in there, you won't get that proper vacuum seal. And, and that's important for, obviously, like the long-term storage. Um, because the whole point of doing this type of preservation is to keep kind of controlled environment that bacteria and everything can get into. So the question was, would the amount of headspace in the jar be the same regardless of the size of jar that you used? Um, normally the recipe will say, no. No, yeah, normally the recipe will have, um, will know what headspace you use and typically it's the same regardless of the jar. Because um, I, I believe that the headspace is more dependent on the recipe rather than the size of the for example, like when we make jams when we're water bath canning, it's only, they only require about a quarter inch of headspace. So we have all the extra. We're good to go. Okay. So you just place on, place the 
lay it on the jar and then screw on the the lid. And why don't you, you're better at this than I am. Because normally I screw it on too, too loosely and then we get like a lot of liquid loss. Okay. Right, so the next step is, put the jar in the canner. And then the way that this canner is designed is it's pretty foolproof. Like you, there's only one way for you to be able to um, turn on or lock on the lid. And as you can see already, there's a pretty good steam, stream of steam. And normally you want to have a really dry stream of steam coming out, so no water droplets or anything like that. Um, and so in the handout I gave you, all these steps are outlined. But typically, if you were doing this for, for real, um, you would let the water boil. Um, and once it reaches this dry stream of steam, let it um, boil like this for 10 minutes. Okay. And as you can see also here, how I noted before that this little safety valve um, kept, started to pop popped up too. And so that again helps you, um, help, makes it more difficult for you to take the can or the lid off when it's under pressure. And one thing Tracy didn't cover that probably we should have in the beginning was that you only fill up about maybe an inch or two of water here. Oh, yes. There's a mark on the inside of the canner itself that'll show you how much drains it up. So you, we only have, you know, a little bit of water here that we got boiling that's now creating the steam pressure. So even if you're doing like the full 16, like double stack thing, it's still the same amount of water? Yeah, so the question was, is it the same amount of water even if we're doing like a full, you know, 16 pint jars? And yeah, it is, because we're just using that water to create steam pressure. Okay. Um, if we were doing a water bath canning, you need to fill the water up to at least an inch above your top can. Okay. Um, so since we're just doing a demo, we're not going to wait the whole 10 minutes. Um, but once the 10 minutes has passed, then you'll put on your pressure regulator. And like I mentioned before, this regulator is 10 pounds of pressure, and we had to purchase it separately from the, um, the canner. But like I said before, once, you'll, once it reaches pressure, it'll start jingling. Um, cool. Well, it needs to process for like... 25 minutes, but we're not we're not going through the whole process because normally so from start to finish It could take you know two to three hours depending on the recipe that you have Luckily like tomatoes they process for about 25 minutes um, But some of the soups um, and things like that that we make the the pints will process for 60 minutes and the quarts will process for 90 minutes And just a little bit of kind of personal wisdom that we've picked up along the way. If you see a recipe that says it's going to process for 90 minutes, that's going to be an entire evening of your time. Yes. Like you said, well, you got you to prep time, you got to build up the pressure in the canner, you got to let it process, you got to let it depressure, you got to take take them out, and then you got to let them cool and seal. So it'll take three or four hours to go through the whole thing. You're not standing there for the whole three or four hours, but it's going to take all night. Yeah. So, so you blow steam out of the thing for like 10 minutes or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then you put your weight on it yep. to build up pressure. Mm -hmm. And then when it starts jingling, then... That's when you start the, the processing time. That's when you start your clock. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So just to reiterate, yeah, you, you want to, when you first seal it, you're going to let the steam start to vent until you see a steady stream of steam with no like water bubbles around the nozzle. And then you're going to wait 10 minutes after that, and then you're going to put the regulator on. And then once the regulator starts to jingle, you know you've reached your pressure that you need to process at, and that's when you start your processing time. So yeah, so again, you, you add like 20 or 30 minutes right there on top of whatever the processing time calls for in the recipe. Also, an important thing to point out too is that because all of this is very like, it's, it's, it's scientific, the, the, the amount of like, chemicals and everything that you have and each individual recipe is going to need to determine how long it's going to need to process for. So you don't want to go off script like when you're doing canning, like use a reliable recipe 
Um, otherwise, it might not get to a proper temperature, the bacteria will not be killed off, you're going to get botulism and wake up blind one morning. So <laughs> that's what it's scaring anybody off. But yeah, definitely find a reliable recipe book and start with that until you really understand the fundamentals of what's going on. Um, another couple things that I've included on the handout were a couple, some resources for canning, and they're both um, for water bath canning and for pressure canning, but the ball has this blue book, which basically looks like a magazine, and this has recipes for both like water bath canning and pressure canning, and um, the website where, it, where we pull the pressure canning instructions called SB Canning, is really good and they also um, administer a Facebook page where there's a really helpful community where I'll just post like, you know, if such and such happened with this type of canning and it didn't really work out well, like, you know, what, kind of, what do you think went wrong type of thing and there are lots of people that kind of chime in and have a lot of experience to add. Like one potential problem we had, is, I think it was last year we made a bunch of borscht, which is obviously like a beet, you know, beet soup. And for some reason, when we processed it, all of the color drained out of the beads. And they were white, like translucent white. And the soup itself was orange. We're like, we don't know why this happened. Is it safe to eat? So that was one of the, a really good resource to kind of go and talk to people. They could share that, yeah, that's happened to us too. You know, it was fine when we ate it. It wasn't a problem that kind of thing. So. So this is what I was talking about when it's starting to jingle, and at least when I practiced this last week, this is a really good indication of why the dial gauge is not always reliable. So this is 10 pounds of pressure, but the dial gauge is reading about 14. So if I had just relied on the dial gauge and stopped it at 10, according to the dial gauge, it probably would have been less than that, um, you know, based off of the actual gauge uh, regulator. Um, so that's part of one reason why we don't rely on the dial gauge. I mean, you can get it calibrated. There are places that will calibrate them, but we just feel like this is more reliable. Um, and that's just our preference, personally. And then plus also, too, you don't have to babysit the gauge. So once it starts to get a pretty steady jingle, you can start your processing time. So for, like we said earlier, the processing time for the tomatoes is 25 minutes. Um, and then basically start the clock around now. And then you can either do stuff around the house or if your living room is close to your kitchen, you can kind of watch TV or something. Um, but as long as you hear this jingling, you know, you can rest assured that your canner is at pressure. Um, but if, you, if for whatever reason you don't hear it jingling, that probably means that the pressure dropped. And so you'll probably want to investigate and figure out what happened. But that so far, that hasn't happened to us at all. So, I mean, that would be, that would happen if somehow you got a leak, um, you know, in your canner of some sort that's somehow relieving pressure. Um, so do you like leave it on high or can you turn it down and still stay at pressure? So, so the question was, can, do you just leave it on a high temperature the whole time or can you turn it down? And you can turn it down if you don't want to use as much propane, as long as you don't turn it down enough that that stops jiggling, basically. Um, so yeah, I usually can turn it down to like a medium or high heat uh, when it's going. Um, one thing too, talking about heat, is that you want to do pressure canning on a gas burner, not an electric stove or anything like that. Um, a lot of electric stoves actually have internal regulators that won't let them get above a certain heat pressure because it'll, you know, crack the glass counter, uh, you know, stove top. Um, so a lot of times you can't get them to the heat pressure you need to do this reliably. And it all, you know, basically adjust itself and fluctuate its own temperature, which you don't want. To do. So, if you have an uh, electric burner, I recommend just buying like a cheap electric, you know, camp stove like we're using here. We used this for like two years. So that's what we have, um, and it's worked out fine. So we have gas burners now in the house, which is nice. Okay. So at this point, we're going to pretend that the 25 minutes have passed, and so. You know, once your processing time has passed, what you do is you take your canner off the heat. Yeah. 
careful. And then, and then you wait. <laughs> and then you wait. And um, basically the steps are, you'll see that it's starting to slow down and it's a jingling and that's because it's slowly depressurizing. And what you do is you wait for the canner to completely come down to atmospheric pressure, which you'll kind of tell by the gauge, but the real telltale sign is when um, this little valve pops down. And once that, that little valve lowers, then you can take the pressure regulator off. Um, many of the places that go through instructions and the steps for pressure canning, highly, highly recommend to not try to speed up the cooling process. Because even though your processing time is 25 minutes, like this is all part of the processing process. And so if you try to speed up the cooling, you might warp your canner, which might not be wonderful, you know, in terms of your investment in your canner. Um, and then also too, you might end up having, um, if you don't slowly depressurize, because you might have like higher pressure in here and lower pressure out here, you might actually have like a lot of liquid loss from your, um, from your jars and things like that. So we'll just wait. Does anyone have any questions? Um, another point on maintenance that I was just thinking about was this this little nozzle here that you have that indicates the pressure. Um, you probably you might not be able to see it. You might not be able to see it too well, but we actually have some kind of like mineral deposits on it where we like can before, just because you know they're they're going to show up in the water, they're going to be in the steam, they're going to get on everything. So that's another thing that you want to just as part of your maintenance is to clean off and use vinegar and stuff to get out of there. Otherwise, it'll stick up or stick down when it shouldn't and give you bad readings. Um, so that's just another thing to be careful of. Um, I think I remember you saying earlier that the little pressure regulator things, the tingling thing, um, that you like stack them. I was wondering if we could get a closer look, maybe we could, like pass them on or something. Like, does it say on there what the poundage is so you can keep track? Like just toss them in the drawer, but still pull it out and be like, oh, this is a 10 pound one. Did you catch that? Or, okay. So, the, so the question was, um, with the regulator, you had talked about how there's separate rings that can get like stacked on there. Um, she was wondering if she could see, like, you know, maybe pass it around and show them what the rings look like and like how they go on and off. Sure. Um, yeah. And also do the kind of mark down there. You know, this is the five pound ring. This um, is the 10 pound ring. No, they're not marked. Where's the other one? I, feel... um, I think it's in here. Oh, it's in there. Okay. Let me put this one right here, take that. Um, so each piece, so there's three pieces, and each piece um, is supposed to be for five pound, five PSI pressure. Um, and so there aren't any markings or anything like that, but once we can, once that, that valve goes down, we'll take it off and we can pass it around so you can take a look at it. So I guess we can go over some of the things that we pressure canned, just to give you a little bit of a variety of what we've done. Um, we've done soups, so we've done like beef stew, chicken soup, ham and bean soup. Um, we've done tomato sauces, like um, for pasta and things like that. What else have we done? Um, we did all that asparagus. Yeah, we still asparagus. We would not recommend canning asparagus. That was a nice, an interesting lesson that we learned. Well, yeah, I, I, I would can it only if you plan on like blending it into a soup later because it just turns. It's too very, very too simple. much. Yeah. It's not very appetizing to like eat by itself. Yeah. But you could use it to infuse asparagus flavor into something. Right. So that was a great lesson that we learned. Um, like potatoes or anything like that. No, we haven't done potatoes. So that's one thing we want to do. Um, Kind of like this coming year, maybe it's do potatoes. People have done chickpeas to make like hummus and stuff like that later on. Beans. There are um, some bean soups, the bean and ham soup. Yeah. How long can you typically store things? Like once you can them and you shove them in the pantry, how long can you? Keep them That's a really good question. So normally um, it's recommended that you. Um, for the best nutritional value is to eat them within a year. But they're still shelf-stable shelf after that. Like we still have a couple of things that we canned a couple years ago, um, but it's just the nutritional value declines after that point. 
and anything that you can, you want to, as soon as you open up, uh, inspect it. Make sure there's nothing growing in there, you don't get any kind of odd smells or anything like that. And to inspect the seal before you open it, the lid, um, to make sure that it has a crack open. If it's cracked open, it's bad, throw it away. Um, and that also comes to a point on storage. When, you, when you're storing cans, you don't want to store them on top of each other. Um, because if they rest on the lids of the other cans, they might artificially like keep the, the uh, lid on there when it's actually broken, so it'll look safe, but it's really not. Right. Um, also, you don't want to store them with the, the screw-on um, caps as well, basically for the same reason. They'll keep the lid on there, even though you might not have actually gotten a vacuum seal with the lid itself. Um, so you want to store them with just the lids and not on top of each other. We're getting there. So has anyone here water bath canned before? Okay, so we have a couple of water bath canners. Yeah. Right. So at least you're familiar with that process. And really, I mean, we were a little intimidated at first by pressure canning because, I mean, you hear about, you know, you have like this. These were used in the Boston bombing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> they turned into bombs. Yeah, I mean, they can turn into bombs. So, um, it is a little daunting, but I think the the key the key idea for just having a safe environment or a safe you know processing experience is to not cut corners and just to follow every step literally and to not take any shortcuts. <clears throat> and I know personally we got into the canning aspect of things, and I think it's important based on like you know, the Liberty Fest and Anarchist group is that this allows you to kind of like disconnect from kind of the industrial agriculture. You don't have to rely on the Walmart down the street to get your food in the winter. You can go to the farmer's market and get really good food during the summer and just prep it and have it sitting in your pantry and it's you know, just as good. Mm -hmm. Like we really loved last year, we made tons and tons of soups uh, during the summer and then when the winter came and you come home from work and you've been driving in the snow and you don't want to make dinner, you crack open this really delicious soup that you know where that produce came from. Yeah. And not only that, you know, not just only where it came from, but you can control the ingredients that goes into it. How much salt's going into it. Right, yeah. yeah. accessories that you're using here other than just the canner? Um, I think the, the extra canning rack and the extra three-piece regulator were about 10 bucks, 10, 15 bucks a piece. And then... And, and sorry to interrupt, but I would personally consider that like a cost you really need to consider buying. Like don't buy just the canner with like the default cap. This makes it so much easier to go from recipe to recipe where you need different pressures and you don't have to worry about a miscalibrated dial. And also, like we've talked about, this is such a long process that if you can fit an extra like, you know, eight can or eight jars into a single process, it just saves so much time and it's yeah. worth the ten or fifteen dollars. Yeah. I mean Presto does sell a sixteen quart canner that only can hold a single layer or a single um, layer, so they can only hold for like eight pints rather than sixteen. And so, if you if you decide just to get a, you know that size canner, you wouldn't need the extra canning rack. But we find it to be really helpful. Again, like what you're saying, just to increase our capacity. So more throughput. Yeah. And then the, the the other tools that we have, like the funnel and the magnets and the thing that for measuring headspace yeah. and the grippers. That was probably what, like ten or fifteen bucks. Yeah, if that. Uh, something around that. Around and that. we bought kind of on the lower end. It's like a starter kit. Yeah. But we've used those tools since we started water bath canning, which was four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so. It's getting there. This is the probably the most boring part about canning. It's 
this way. <laughs> so you're waiting for it to get low enough pressure that you can open it? Yeah. Well, first, okay. basically, we're just waiting for. Well, we're waiting for it to go down so we can take the regulator off. And we let that vent until there's no steam, basically, right? Yeah, well, we, I think we wait about two, we wait two minutes right. after the regulator comes off, and then we can open it up. Mm -hmm. We can open up the canner. The little thing goes down, and then you can take the regulator off. And mm -hmm. then, okay. yeah. Yeah. And then you just give it a few minutes to make sure all that steam pressure's out before you open it up. And not only do you do that for your own safety, you don't want a bunch of steam under high pressure coming into your face, which is the most important thing, but if you take it off too quickly, you disturb the balance of the jars in there, and they'll actually like spill liquid out and stuff like that, and break their seals, and you'll lose. Yeah, because you're yeah. If you take it off too quickly, then it's like all this high pressure in here and then atmospheric okay. after. So. Okay. Um, okay. So, so okay, down. So yeah, the little valve went down, so you can take this off. And we'll just wait like a minute or so, and then we can open up the canner. And one thing about opening up the canner is that you open it away from you. So when I open this up, I'll like actually flip it this way instead of flipping that way, so I don't get a bunch of steam in my face. So is there anything um, that anyone's interested in canning that they might have questions about? What's that? Fruits and jams. And we do a lot of fruits and jams. We actually we moved into a new house and we found out we had a bunch of black raspberries going on the property. So we made lots and lots of jam. Yeah. Um, is there a way to do that without all the sugar? I mean, can you substitute stevia for the sugar or something like that? You can use substitutes. Uh, we used honey okay. from our, our friend down the road. Keeps, okay. keeps a couple hives, so he gave us honey that we used instead. And I think it's about two thirds as much honey as you is the recipe calls corn sugars. Yeah, it's either two thirds or three quarters. I would look online and, and people have posted, you know, in terms of making adjustments for sugar substitutes. Okay. Are there things you recommend not canning? Is there anything you recommend not canning? Besides asparagus. <laughs> Besides asparagus. Um, so some things that you'll find like on the SB canning website and um, I think in the, well, I don't know if you'll find the ball game, but um, any like pureed um, vegetables, like if you want to make pureed pumpkin or something like that, they recommend not pressure canning because, um, just because of the consistency of, of a pureed substance, it might not be able to completely um, reach the interior of the jar and get it to the right temperature. Mm -hmm. So what they recommend doing is like cutting it in chunks, you know, just like, you know, small, um, you know, just chopping it up in chunks and, and um, pressure canning that. And then later on, like when you actually want to cook whatever you want to cook, then puree it when you open it up. How about starches? Can you can like rice or pasta? That's another good point. For starches, they recommend not um, canning starches. So when we made chicken soup, what we did was we made the soup without the pasta in it. And so there's like, you know, we have your jar, there's about, you know, this much soup and then about this much of your veggies and chicken and stuff like that. And then when we open it up, we'll throw it in a saucepan, throw the, throw the pasta in it and let it boil and cook the pasta that way. Um, let's see, other things like, I mean, kind of similar to the asparagus, Broccoli is pretty bad for gaining. Like any, any vegetable that you think if you steam it, it gets kind of bushy, you probably don't want to yeah. eat it because it's like really bushy. But I would highly recommend the ball canning, the, this canning book for recipes if um, you're not familiar with it already. It, like I said, it has both recipes for jams and for water bath canning, but also. Um, soups and vegetable recipes for pressure canning as well. Okay, so I think we're at the point where we can open it up. And like I said before, I'm going to open this away from me because it still might have a little bit of steam that comes out. Okay. Just like that. And then the next step is you want to wait for this to cool for about 10 minutes before you pull it out. But then, just for the sake of the demo, 
um, we'll pull it out a little bit early. And so after the 10 minutes, you'll pull it out, and that's what your jar looks like. And then normally what we'll do is we'll set it out on a set of towels on our counter, and then wait overnight for it to cool. And then usually you'll hear, when it seals, you hear like a little pop, pop, pop in your kitchen and everything. So that's how you know that um, at least it started to seal. And then after it's cooled overnight, then we take off the screw caps um, right here. But you don't want to take it off beforehand because sometimes um, like it hasn't completely sealed yet. And so sometimes you might actually like take the lid off, use, you know, the air and stuff like that, which was to be the whole purpose of the last like two or three hours. Um, so don't do that. So wait until it's completely cooled and um, overnight before you take uh, the screw caps off. And then after that point, you can put it in your pantry and then wait until you're ready to open it. So, so to know that you have made the complete seal, it's just going to be like, you know, pop inward? Yep. Yep, it'll be kind of your concave yep. yeah. surface and so the convex, which it probably is right now. And one thing too is you don't want to like screw the cap at all, like tap on it or anything like that, because you it might indent basically like give you a false reading that you've indented it by tapping on it, but you didn't actually get the seal that you needed. Right. So really and that's that's more or less the reason that once you take the lid off, you keep it in here for ten minutes. It's not because like the glass is going to explode on you or anything. You want to give that lid basically a chance to like start to cool without being tampered with or touched or anything, so that you just get a, a, a proper reading on whether or not it's sealed. Because that's the whole point of the process, I think, is to get that seal. Yeah. Oh. Um, one thing we didn't mention earlier too, when she was prepping the jar, um, is that after you pack everything in and you've measured your headspace and you're about to put the lid on. You want to make sure you take like a towel or something and just like wipe it around the rim. We didn't do that because it's just a demo. Again, especially with like jams where you might get like goop as you've been ladling stuff in there that's stuck there. Because you just want to have an unobstructed surface between the lid of the jar and the glue of the lid that's going to make that seal. Well, I think that does it in terms of walking through the whole process. So thanks for coming out. Yeah. Happy camping. You want to start cleaning up here and I'll get the quiet.